In our last video, we saw that the structural versus reduced form debate is really about choosing different points on a spectrum of structural models. But there's still a weightier question to answer. What does it even mean for any of these models to be identified? Is this identified? Is probably the most common question you'll hear in an economic seminar. But here's the truth. Most economists can't even agree on what they mean when they say that. Today we're going to fix that and show you why understanding identification is so crucial to navigating the structural versus reduced form spectrum. If you ask five different economists what identification means, you might get five different answers. Some might say it's when your instrument is valid, or when you have enough data, or when you have the right variation in your data. Others might say it's when the balance checks pass, or on the lighter side, when the referees stop asking questions. All of these miss the point because identification isn't about statistics or qualitative feelings. It's about logic and it's about the population, not the data. Arthur Lubel, a renowned econometrician from Boston College, put it best when he said that identification is about whether the question that we want to answer is in principle even answerable. Even if we had data from the population that was an infinite sample size. Formally, the definition we'll use is that a parameter is identified if it's uniquely determined by what we can observe about the population. So let's unpack what this definition entails. What do we mean by parameter? Parameter is just something about the population that we're interested in knowing. It could be a mean, it could be a correlation, it could be a demand elasticity. It's just something about the population that we want to know about. Uniquely determined means there's only one possible value that that parameter can take on, given what we can observe. What do we mean by what we can observe? Well, we observe the joint distribution of everything that's measurable about the population. We also observe specific features of the population. And as you'll notice, we've been talking a lot about the population. That's because identification has nothing to do with a particular data set. It has to do with if we had all the data that this population could produce, would we be able to answer the question that we want to answer? Before we go any further, it's really important to understand that there's an ordering to the different steps we take to produce an econometric analysis. First is identification. Is the question that we want to answer even answerable? Second is estimation, which concerns how can we use the data to approximate the answer to the question that we want to answer. Third is inference, which means how uncertain are we about the approximated answer to the question that we want to answer. Fourth is hypothesis testing. Can we put certain bounds on the values that our approximation is taking on? Can we rule out certain values? The final conclusion is what have we learned by going through all this process and how can we use it to make the world better? The key point is that if we get identification wrong, then everything else that follows is meaningless. This is why identification is the foundation of this spectrum of structural estimation or structural models because it concerns the less structural models like RCTs and instrumental variables as well as the most structural models like complex equilibrium models. And speaking of models, it's also important to understand that identification always requires a model. Let's just consider the simple linear regression model from our introductory econometrics course at the undergraduate level. We have y equals x beta plus epsilon. What do we need for beta to be identified? Well, there's two types of assumptions that we need to make. One is a statistical assumption, which is that we need to have some variation in x in order to identify the parameter beta. The other is a behavioral assumption or a behavioral restriction, and that has to do with whether we can interpret beta as being a causal parameter. And to do that, we would need to make an assumption about epsilon and x, and specifically that the expected value of epsilon conditional on x is equal to zero. The behavioral restriction is where economics comes in. It's, it's an assumption about how the world works that the unobservables in our population are not correlated with the observable x. And again, just like in, I discussed briefly in the last video, RCTs have restrictions too. They have behavioral restrictions about does randomization actually remove any bias in treatment uptake, as well as assumptions about potential outcomes. So let's think a little bit more about identification using an RCT example. Let's consider a case where we want to understand 
if a new drug improves health outcomes. So we observe who got treated and who didn't and what their outcome was. So the question is, can we identify the causal effect of treatment on the outcome in this case? And the answer is not necessarily. And why is this? Well, because we don't observe counterfactual outcome for each person in our data. We only observe the outcome that they got under the treatment assignment that they received. So if someone's in the control group, we don't know what their outcome would have been if they were treated and similar for the treatment group. In order to have a causal effect, we need to compare what actually happened with what would have happened. But what would have happened is inherently unobservable. And so we need to make some assumptions to make up for that shortcoming. And we want to find the most plausible counterfactual outcome or what we would expect to happen under the counterfactual scenario. What we learn is that multiple different treatment effects could be consistent with the observed correlation between treatment status and outcomes. So this is where the structural spectrum that we've been talking about becomes crucial. If we have a less structural approach, then we're going to lean more on how random was the treatment assigned. If it was purely randomly assigned, then we can use an RCT to estimate the average treatment effect or other treatment effects of interest. If we had a natural experiment, we could maybe use instrumental variables or difference in differences and so forth. If we wanted to use a more structured model, we might instead assume that people are choosing their treatment status according to some utility maximization and then make assumptions about what the functional form of that utility function is. The key insight is that these aren't fundamentally different approaches. They're both requiring assumptions and different aspects of the population data, namely what's the correlation between the unobservables and treatment status. Let's talk a little bit about some myths of identification and whether they hold up in reality. One myth is that identification requires statistical significance, meaning that if I got an estimate that was not statistically significant, that would imply that that parameter was not identified. This is false, and the reason that it's false is because statistical significance has nothing to do with identification. I can have a parameter that it's very well identified, but it's not statistically significant in my estimation procedure, and I can have the reverse be true as well. I could have a parameter with very tight confidence interval that is not identified or poorly identified. Another myth is that more data solves identification problems. This is also false if we th are thinking of more data meaning more observations. And the reason why is because identification is about if we had a sample size of infinity or if we observed the entire population. If we're talking about more data meaning additional measurements of the population, then that myth could be true. So it just depends what we mean by more data. Another myth is that simple models are automatically better identified. This is also false. In reality, it just depends on what assumptions are being made and what things are observable in the population. Another myth related to the previous one is that models with more structure are more difficult to identify. Again, this is about what assumptions are you making? How credible are those assumptions given what we know about the population? Sometimes more structure actually helps with identification because it provides additional restrictions on the model. So hopefully this helps you see that this spectrum of structural estimation is actually a spectrum and that the fundamental problem that underpins this entire spectrum is identification. And no matter what econometric method or approach we're taking, we still have to solve this identification problem. Just to review, as we end our video, what is identification? Identification is about whether the question that we want to answer is answerable given what we can observe in the population and what we're willing to assume. Identification is about logic, not statistics, not data. Whether you're running an RCT or estimating a general equilibrium model, the problem of identification is one that you'll need to grapple with. And that's what unifies all of these methods and, and it's what distinguishes econometrics from statistics. In the next video, we'll talk about what it means for a model to have more structure. We'll also talk about how sometimes having additional structure can be useful for learning additional things about the world. I hope you'll join me and we'll see you in the next one.